Hey everybody, welcome back to the next part in my Creating a Great Tone series for our Line 6 Helix. Today I wanted to talk about digital clipping and how big an issue this actually is. Because if you read some of the forums and talk to a few folks, they really seem to always be on edge about digital clipping. Now on one hand I could say, as they should be, because digital clipping is a pretty awful thing. Um, if we push the limits too much and we surpass that point where things start clipping digitally, it's a real awful sound. It doesn't sound good. It uh, can potentially ruin a, a great recording and a great performance. Um, having said that, it's really not something I've ever been super concerned about and for good reason. Okay, so what happened is there's been a lot of discussion in the recent past about sort of best methods for creating uh, Helix presets. And I did a whole series of videos on gain staging, unity gain, properly leveling your presets in a way that is going to make sense and in a way that's going to work in most situations. Um, having said that, you know, it's, it's impossible to ever say this is the only way to do things because as soon as you say that, somebody will have a different purpose that you never thought of or is different than your uses and it'll kind of need maybe a different type of handling or more care, right? Maybe lower levels, maybe higher levels. So I just wanted to talk about this idea of digital clipping because there's this misconception which I kind of debunked in my gain staging and leveling uh, and unity gain videos that you know when we put an amp block on that that amp block should be at unity gain with our instrument level going into the helix now i'm not saying that that would necessarily cause you any great hardship uh, it could uh, maybe not give you the outcome that you wanted but it does seem to be a bit of an arbitrarily low level to just make this blanket statement that it must match when we turn it on and off now there is one time, and I mentioned this in my, my video about leveling presets, that I think that that would be important. And if in the normal use of that preset, you were going to be engaging and disengaging the amp and cab block, and you needed those two to match and level, then absolutely. And if you needed more level, you could always go to your output block and boost that. So absolutely. But if it's a preset where the amp and cab block, like almost all of my presets, and I'm sure a lot of you folks as well, where the amp and cab block is just designed to be left on and never touched, then it really doesn't matter. And in a lot of cases, it seems like kind of not a great way to work. Um, so I had mentioned in my properly leveling a preset patch that what I do when I set up my clean sound is I crank the channel volume up to 10. And as I proved using null tests and using proper gain staging, in most cases, this isn't going to cause much of an issue. You know, some folks said, yeah, but now you're hitting the next things in, in the chain with more volume. And in most cases, that's either just a complete non-issue because as I, I proved with the null tests that just because we're hitting linear blocks with more uh, level doesn't mean it changes the tone in any way. If we're hitting something with non-linear characteristics, that's a different story. But even then, it's not that crucial unless we're hitting something like the vintage digital or the bubble vibrato, which I'll, I'll use uh, a couple examples later on. But those are actually built into the model to mimic a particular situation where you could get digital clipping. That's not the digital clipping on the whole path, it's just in that block. And all, almost all those cases have headroom controls which we can just get rid of any of the unwanted artifacts really simply. So it's just not really an argument because the one thing that I've seen a lot, and I did a video recently about properly setting up your power cabs, you know, something like a power cab is expecting a certain signal to operate at its proper designed level and to give the proper sound of the speaker. So if we aren't hitting it with the appropriate amount of level, uh, then it's not going to function the way it was designed. And then possibly we go back to our Helix and go, well, I can't get enough input into the Helix because I've been told that, you know, the final output of the preset should be at unity gain with the instrument level. Um, meaning, you know, we can't even go touch the output block. And this is an argument I've heard so many times. So after I debunked all of that, and sorry to have to go through all that again, you can watch those videos on my channel, but uh, after I went through all that, 
and I had some discussions with folks, nobody could give me a good reason why I was still incorrect in stating this, um, other than the one that always kept coming back, which was, yes, but you have to watch out for digital clipping. So today I want to examine this topic of digital clipping and how big an issue it actually is, and if it's something we should be wildly concerned about in the normal course of making Helix presets. So let's go over to HX Edit. And what I have here is a setup similar to what I was using in those previous videos, I have Cubase with a DI'd guitar track right here. Recorded from USB 7 off of my Helix. All right, so that's just my DI'd guitar. That's, uh, you know, now was I hitting it as hard as I could? No, but I was playing it fairly aggressively. Um, probably more aggressive than I would, or maybe about the same as I would normally play, maybe a little bit on the heavier side. Um, you know, if you're really worried about clipping and, and pushing the limits, then you would want to really hit hard to make sure you're not, you know, going to be uh, running out of headroom. But that's what I have for now for this test. So I'm going to slide that over here. And that Cubase file, audio file, is feeding back into my Helix uh, under USB 3.4. So this is the same as just feeding my guitar into the Helix. I'm going to get the same levels and whatnot. And I've set up three snapshots. Snapshot one is these two amps that I have on just bypassed. Snapshot two is the Jazz Chorus model at its stock settings as it comes up just when you click it and it pops up. And then Snapshot 3 turns that off and turns on a Rev Gen Red at its stock settings as it comes up, okay? And the reason I did that is to compare a few different scenarios. Okay, so let's take a look first and see what happens on my meters here. I'm going to zero my meters off. This is the RMS Max meter. That's giving the uh, average volume level, kind of more close to our perceived loudness, what we're going to hear. And the Peak Max, which is a peak meter. We're gonna talk about these. So let's just get our readings first. So if I start this file and play it through on a loop, Okay, we see we have an RMS max around minus 35.9. We could probably just round that to minus 36 for ease of, of memory on it. And a peak of minus 18.3. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, like I mentioned, the RMS max is our average volume level. That's quite low and quite quiet as you can hear. So that's my instrument level coming in with whatever guitar I use to play this. And I, I've used this, this file uh, for a few different videos, so I can't even remember which guitar it is. Doesn't matter. Every guitar is gonna be a little different. We could have higher output pickups, and in which case you'll have less headroom. But we have to take these concepts I'm talking about and adjust them for our particular use. So I'm not giving you any blanket things to do here. Um, and my peak max, the maximum signal that hit this is minus 18.3. And that references minus 18.3 dB full scale, okay? So at zero dB full scale, we are going to run into digital clipping like that, like flicking a light switch, okay? There's no easing into it like it was in the analog world. Once we hit zero, surpass zero, we are going to have digital clipping and it isn't pleasant. But I have on the absolute peaks, I have 18 plus dB of headroom here, okay? So that's a lot to go. So this idea that somehow we have to make everything match that is just doesn't make sense to me because we're leaving a lot of good, clean headroom on the table that could well be used in our DAW, in our power cab, or whatever situation we are using, okay? Now I've tested the power cab, 212 and 112, and going out digitally out of my Helix and going out analog into the analog inputs on the power cabs, and I can go all the way up to this same zero dB level till there is audible clipping, and I've done tests recording it back into the DAW, and it all works out that way. So we have lots of headroom here. So the idea of picking this as some kind of arbitrary number, unless there was good reason, which nobody has given me other than this apparent clipping thing, uh, doesn't really make a lot of sense. And so obviously we have lots of headroom here. We don't need to keep things at this level. But here's why this is a tough thing too, because I hear most folks talking about, oh, I, co I, I try to aim for, you know, whatever level on my peak meter. Well, let's take a look at something and see how this changes. I, I would think that most folks are not utilizing the Helix to just play. So let's go to snapshot two here, where I've engaged the jazz chorus model. That's the only thing that's turned on. Now, when I put that up, and just the stock settings. Let's see what readings we get on it. OK, 
Okay, so our, our average volume has gone up by approximately 2 dB, and our peaks have gone up by approximately 4-ish dB, you know, roughly. So by most people's standards then, what they're saying is, well, you should actually lower that channel volume then so it matches when it's turned on and off. Well, let's listen to the difference between snapshot one and snapshot two. It does seem like snapshot two is louder and that is, is also backed up by the meter. So let's come into snapshot two and if we go by what everybody says we should, which I think is kind of ridiculous, let's lower this down and see what we have on our readings now. Now we're extremely close in the perceived loudness. And what do we have here as far as peak then? The peaks are almost 2 dB louder than they were. So we've lost 2 dB of headroom by putting this amp on. Okay, so that's kind of interesting, I guess, and kind of shows you that the peak meters, other than for telling us how much headroom we have until clipping, they don't really tell us a lot about the sound and what we're hearing. Something like an RMS uh, meter or a loudness meter itself would also work much better for this type of a thing, okay? Um, and I just didn't want to bounce back and forth between loudness and RMS. We'll just use this for now as it's not that crucial. But we're still leaving a lot of good clean headroom on. Now here's the thing. The bypass instrument level and a very, very clean sound like the jazz chorus sound are very transient rich sounds, meaning there's always quite an attack to them. There's a, the loudest peak is when the, you hear the picks hitting the string. There's no natural compression to it. So those peaks a lot of times don't allow us to get kind of the body uh, average volume up very high because we're getting closer to peaking and possible digital clipping. Well, what happens when we go over now to snapshot three? Let's see what the readings are with the Rev Gen Redstock settings. Okay, so we see a much different picture here. 8 dB louder average volume. But did you notice something about the peaks? And let's do this again. The peak meters are showing about the same level of peaking as we had on Snapshot 1 with the Jazz Chorus model. But with a massive perceived loudness difference. So if we use peak meters, to set these things, the difference between clean and distorted sounds is gonna be all over the map. This is eight dB louder on the RMS meters. Now there's a reason for that. These distorted sounds have a natural compression to them. They don't have the same transient attack. They're not as transient rich a tone as a clean sound. So we actually have a much louder signal with the same amount of clean headroom, if that makes sense. It's kind of interesting stuff about the difference between the peak meter and using an RMS meter. But now that's kind of neither here nor there anyways, because any way you slice it, we're being told, well, this should actually come back down to instrument level. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to take my channel volume, I'm going to move it way down until this gets in and around minus 36 on my average level. So that's getting closer. So let's play this and listen to our different snapshots here. Now 
Now that we've got the perceived loudness of the distorted tone down to matching kind of that instrument level perceived loudness, the peaks are down to minus 24 and a half. Now we have 24 dB of clean headroom, 6 dB more than when we were talking about the clean sound. So you see how this kind of gets confusing because I wanted to bring that up because you kind of go, you're gonna tell me that you're always gonna peak at minus 12, let's say. Well, are we talking clean sound? Are we talking distorted sound? The peak meters are not gonna give an accurate representation of anything other than how much headroom we have before we start clipping with the loudest portion of that sound. That's why in my video where I was talking about properly leveling Helix presets, I said, well, if we're never going to go between the amp block and cab block being turned on and off with the instrument level signal, it's a total arbitrary number to say we have to match it to that because it's never going to be a real scenario. And we're leaving all of this headroom on the table, which really doesn't make a lot of sense to me. There's no benefit. As I showed with null tests, by boosting the volume at different places in the chain, it doesn't necessarily change the tone unless we're feeding it into a non-linear block. And if you don't understand what that means, go back and watch those videos and that'll kind of clear it up for you. So now we have all this clean headroom that we're kind of leaving on the table. So in a situation where we are going to go and maybe play into a power cab, we're not gonna have anywhere near enough signal going into that. If we're recording into our DAW, look at my meters here. I'm recording, I'm leaving all of this headroom on. Now I heard some arguments where people say, yeah, but you know, then you'll have to turn this down if it's too loud, if you take a, and I say, yeah, well that, I mean, that's what mixing is, right? We only have 6 dB of headroom up here without going into our input pre-gain up here, which I don't ever touch, there's no point in that. And now I, I, I'm still nowhere near peaking. I'm still, I have about 18 and a half dB of gain, even if I went to one of the more transient tones, right? Even with this crank 6 dB, I've still got 10 dB of clean headroom there. And what's going to happen possibly is even in a DAW, if I have to get more out of this, my fader is going to run out of room to get me up where I need to. And I can add other stages of game, but that would be silly when we could have just added it properly from the beginning. And if we have to come in here after the fact and pull this back, 4 or 5 dB, then that's fine. I can go from zero down to off. So there's lots of play on the way down, not so much play on the way up without adding different gain stages. So it doesn't really make sense to me. So I want to, and it's always been good practice in the analog world, and I still think in the digital world, let's get as healthy, clean a signal as we can into our source to get a best signal to noise ratio like I talked about before. Okay, so we're not doing that at this point, right? And it's really not doing us any favors. We're nowhere near clipping. So the time that somebody says to you, oh, it ha you know, the instrument level has to match the, when the amp is turned on and off, the amp block is turned on and off, that's just nonsense. It does not, there's no reason, it will, you will not be anywhere near clipping. Unless, of course, your instrument level going in is also clipping. But I have never come across that. At which point, it's going to be a useless signal anyways, because it's going to just be clipping all the time in which case you've got to look at using a different input or possibly putting the guitar input pad on, right? There's solutions to these problems. So this idea that we're gonna be so close to clipping because you know we are going anywhere above this sort of imaginary uh, nominal level of uh, instrument level is just nonsense, you know? It would be like somebody saying, um, you know, I'm driving in a, in a 60 mile an hour zone, but I'm just gonna be safe. I'm gonna only drive 20 miles an hour. You know, well, okay, I guess, um, you know, you're probably not gonna do any harm. You're probably gonna have a few mad people at you, uh, but it's gonna take you way longer to get where you're going. And there are a lot of downsides to that that you know, there's no danger of going 60 miles an hour. We might as well go if that's the legal limit and we can go there without you know, any sort of penalty. In this case, penalty is digital clipping. It's just leaving way too much headroom for no other reason than just say, well, I, you know, I just better play it safe. So it just hasn't made a lot of sense to me. Now, the next thing that I talked about in gain, gain staging video was you know, people say, well, what if we hit another block after it with a, a signal that it's not designed to receive? Well, this is nonsense too, as I prove with the null tests. You know, take something like linear effects like reverbs, a lot of the reverbs, um, a lot of the delays. 
Doesn't matter whether we hit it with a little tiny bit of signal or a whole lot of signal, the sound is identical. There's no change whether we hit it with a lot or a little. Now other things like transistor tape delay, uh, vintage uh, delay, uh, bubble vibrato, um, you know, the LA Studio Comp, those are going to be non-linear processes from, from my understanding of them and from what I've heard from them. Um, so those you're going to have to decide how much signal you want to hit into them. But even in my experience with them, even if you go, you know, with sort of the loudest signal coming out of an amp block on 10, the, the, the change is minuscule. It's not, you probably won't even notice it unless you have something like the bubble vibrator or vintage delay, which I'll talk about in a second. There might be other blocks like this too. We'll talk about that in a second. So what if I come over here to my snapshot three, uh, or actually, no, let's go to my snapshot two with my jazz course. And I just said, I'm just going to crank the channel volume up and I'm going to add a little bit more on the drive as well. And let's see what it sounds like. Still pretty clean. Well, now what we're getting is peaks up around minus 7.7 .7. RMS max up around 25 or so. We still got so much clean headroom here that we're not even anywhere near in danger of clipping. And that's with adding more channel volume and more drive. What if I take the drive all the way up on this? You'll notice that now I have an RMS max of around minus 20. My peak is still 6 dB away from clipping when I've cranked all of this. Now, is this going to be the same for every amp model? I don't know. I haven't tested every one of them. You're going to know when you're too loud because you're going to hear clipping, you know? So there's no danger of, you know, I'm not saying to push the limits way, way up. But if you're measuring things with your meters and you're within this ballpark of leaving 6 dB of headroom, you've got tons of headroom. You're not gonna have any problem. Now, if I go over to Snapshot 3, play the same thing. And I'm gonna crank the channel volume to 10 on that. Now we'll switch between two and three. That would be up to you to decide whether one is louder and say, oh, maybe I'll bring the channel volume back a bit on that or I'll, I'll boost the, you know, we could even come in here and say, oh, I want the master louder and I want the drive louder. Maybe we decide that that's where we want to be. I've still got tons of clean headroom to go here, even though I've really cranked these up. Okay, now some folks will say, well, what about if you feed it into something like, I don't know, this bubble vibrato? Let's take a listen to what happens now when we, when we play this. You can hear this digital distortion. That is not because we are too high on any of our signal path here. Nothing to do with that. It simply has to do with however this was modeled doesn't have as much headroom in that little internal model. That's why we have a headroom control. Watch as I play it, listen for that digital distortion and as I move the headroom control it will disappear. And the way we can prove this, if I take the mix down, we have no clipping. So we see that the headroom control has lessened that to a great degree. You really hear it here exaggerated.
This is part of the sound of that bumble vibrato, okay? Uh, I could also do it with the vintage delay. Now, if that was really bothering you, you needed to hit that with a little bit less signal, then you can absolutely do that. And I talked about that ad nauseum in my gain staging videos, where if you're sending a signal into something that's making it do something you don't want it to, then send less signal. That would make sense, because that would be a good reason for why you would want to do that, okay? Otherwise, there is no good reason. Now, if we went to something like the example I used before, which was the vintage digital delay, same sort of idea. We hear that digital clipping. If I go to my headroom control, that's gone. And the only reason that ever was like that is because it was on a 12-bit setting which is designed to have less headroom. It's supposed to do that. There's nothing wrong with our signal path. It's not clipping anything. It's causing the vintage digital delay in this case to act as it is set and as it is supposed to. So that's why we have a headroom control say, well, I like everything else about it. I don't want those little clips in there. So I need to take that out, right? So you'll notice here, even with all of this nonsense going on, cranking things up, and we'll just get rid of this for a second. I'm still leaving myself with a lot of headroom. I still have 6 dB of headroom. I can go all the way up with this fader and I'll just barely get into clipping, I'll bet you. You see what happened? My clip light comes on and I'm at 0.1 over because I went 6.02. If I pull this back to 5.8, that'll probably go away. You can see I'm at minus 0.1 because I knew I had 5.9 dB of headroom. Okay, so this is how this really works. And, and it's, I think it's important to understand this because so many folks are throwing out some pretty bad information. You know, we have to make sure that the signal, instrument level signal going into the helix never gets surpassed on our output. It's gotta be a unity gain with that. As I mentioned before, the instrument level signal oftentimes, again, depending on the guitar, is a very low level signal that's designed to be boosted up to a higher level signal, right? So this idea that everything has to stay there means we're leaving a lot of clean headroom on the table with no risk of clipping, right? I mean, of course there's a risk of clipping if we really go crazy and start hitting the front end of things with so much. But, you know, if I go through here and uh, change snapshot to, let's say, of uh, where we have the, um, we have the jazz chorus model and just change it out to different models. So here's the first model I came across, and when I cranked the channel volume to 10, that it started clipping. So you say, aha, but watch. I mean, the drive is also high on that too. So if I come in and play this again, turn it into a clean sound by pulling the drive back, I need that channel volume up on 10 to get that same sort of level signal. You see, so it's not like an aha moment. Um, Cali, Texas Channel 2. Obviously not going to be able to get that one up all the way, but what if I bring my drive controls down to get a cleaner sound out of it? So you see why we have that channel volume and it can be on 10 a lot of times and it doesn't have to match the sound of it being turned off, right?
that's doing no harm at all whatsoever. So I think in the examples you heard when I pushed it way too far, right away you went, whoa, what, what's going on here? That's really loud, it's clipping. Right, so pull it back. That's not the right thing for that situation. But this idea that digital clipping and headroom is the reason why we always have to have you know, unity gain with our instrument level input just doesn't make sense. But as I said before, if there is a real purpose for keeping a level down, maybe that bubble vibrato, maybe even with the headroom all the way up and it's hitting, you're still hearing some graininess you don't like. Well, fine, hit it with less input going into it. That's fine, there's a reason for it. You can always make up for that on the output block if you need more signal, okay? Now, I'm not saying we should push the limits to get it right up to, you know, minus 0.5 dBFS just so that we're getting every, there's really no purpose in that, I don't think. Uh, then we're just playing with fire and we might be getting a little bit too close, right? To where, you know, back to the driving analogy, if we do 90 in a 60 zone, well, now we're in danger of getting pulled over, right? We're in that danger zone and something bad could happen. So maybe we should pull it back and stay within the more reasonable safe range. So, but I usually work where if I'm seeing minus six, minus five on my peak meters on my cleanest sounds, I'm not really, when I'm hitting fairly hard, I'm not really worried. I've left myself a good amount of headroom. I'm going to get good signal coming out of my power cab if I'm using that. I'm gonna have good signal going into my DAW. And so what if I have to turn the volume down a little bit after the fact, right? Then that's perfectly fine. It's not going to do any harm whatsoever. And you notice when we just put in amp blocks, I even left, if you notice, I even forgot to reset this down to zero where it would have had even more headroom for for these different amp blocks. You take the, uh, take the Cali Texas channel two here. I still have to push that up really high for it to even come close to clipping. And then if I adjust the drive controls, I can, you know, I can get it out of that range anyways and get a cleaner sound. So that's why we have those controls. So this idea that we just can't ever go above this instrument level, I think and I hope is now totally debunked unless it's causing you a true issue. But we do have a lot of clean headroom and I see no reason to not use it. If it's there, we might as well just use it, right? So. I hope that was clear guys and I hope that is helpful and this will kind of go in that series of videos. I have a playlist of those as well because I think it's a really, really important topic that there's a lot of misinformation being spread about, right? Now again, if you're feeding some other piece of equipment that this isn't matching with and you have to have a lower level, then that's what you should do. But in a lot of those cases, we can just change the output level of what we're feeding out of our Helix from you know, instrument to line to, to mic, depending on the outputs we're using, which is going to fix that problem for us, more likely than having to go in and cut way back on our actual preset volume. So, so I hope that was helpful. I hope it was informative. I thought it was an important final kind of video to debunk another myth about this idea that we're, you know, at instrument level, we're so necessarily so close to clipping, you know, and if we are, we should probably be pulling the, you know, putting the guitar input pad on, maybe using the aux in, which is designed more for active pickups and high output sources so that we aren't, because if we're hitting the front of an amplifier with that much more signal anyways, it's, the amplifier is going to act different. We're going to get more distortion. We're not going to get the same tone out of it as if we're hitting it with just sort of a normal output uh, pickup, let's say. Okay. So I hope that makes sense. Anyways, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope that was helpful. Uh, please leave me any questions you have. I really try to get back to them. I can't always all the time, but please like the video, share it if you don't mind with anybody who you think would get use out of it. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and uh, hit the little bell notification to get notified when I put new content out and I will be back soon with some more content. Thanks so much again for tuning in. Ciao for now.